Welcome one, welcome all to The Loot Doctor, where we prescribe all things looter shooters or looter in general. I think ARPG classifies as a pretty good place to look for some loot. Alright, but let's get into it. If you clicked on this video, you're probably like me and you want to play the Lich. But the Lich doesn't really feel like what you think the, the power fantasy of the Lich should feel like. After all, the unique skill of the Lich is the Reaper form, where you turn into a dual-wielding scythe, Reaper of Souls, menace, almost. And if you're like me, you tried out the Reaper form, and you just couldn't figure out why it felt so bad. It felt like you didn't deal damage, you died so fast, you couldn't find enough enemies to keep your health bar topped off, and you might have just given up on the Lich entirely. Or you're sitting there right now scratching your head and just wondering why it's not working. Don't worry, I've got you. I figured it out. Um, after extensive searching on the internet, I couldn't find a single Lich build that was a melee Lich that really felt like it fulfilled the power fantasy of what I think a Reaper of Souls should be. So guys, I made it for you. And I'm here to share my build, share my findings, and share some interesting things to look out for if you're trying to do a melee Lich. But... Enough talk, let's get into it. So like all good Last Epoch builds, the most important skill is the one that you're going to be spamming the most. For us, that will be Harvest, a simple slash in front of you attack that allows you to cleave your way through enemies. So now let's get into the Harvest skill tree that we're using for the build. So Harvest does about 3009 damage at its base right now, and it has a 80% chance to shred necrotic resistance on hit, and then it has an 80% increased area of effect, allowing us to hit more enemies within our range. Then it has a 9% base critical chance, which is very good because a 9% base critical chance means that at base, your harvest has a 9% chance to crit by itself before any of the multipliers that are added on top of it. Next, we have whenever we hit a cursed enemy, we get 40% crit chance for all of our attacks. The reason that this is good is because we will be hitting cursed enemies constantly because our curse is toggleable. Next, we have the symbol of lost, which increases our damage against cursed enemies by a multiplier whenever we're using harvest. And next, we'll get into the reaper farm, the real reason that we're all here, right? Constantly maintaining and staying in this form is difficult, as the form has a constant health drain and decay. Popping health potions is merely a means of delaying the inevitable of you losing the form. But you can also spam Reap, the dash ability that replaces the ability once it is in use, to continuously gain more health. Some additional important notes about Reaper Form. Reaper Form serves as a separate health bar, unlike the Druid transformations in which if you actually do die in Reaper Form, you do simply just go back to human form. Now, Reap has a 20 second cooldown that is only applied after you are knocked out of Reaper Form. But with those two out of the way, let's get into the actual skills and the order in which they are important. First on the list is Mistress of Decay, which decreases the health drain and increases the damage over time that you deal while in Reaper form. Next is Harbinger of Blood, which increases your health leech and your healing effectiveness and how much base health you get from reaping. Next is Swift Harbinger, which decreases the cooldown of reap while you are in the Reaper form. These and the other two skills before are critically important for keeping you alive and keeping you sustained in Reaper form for as long as possible. Next on the list is Death Touch Scythe, which is simply a skill that we are using to get to the next skill. We are just putting one point into it for the quick amount of necrotic damage. Next is Sweeping Scythes. This increases our Reap effective range so that Reap sends us farther with each time we use it. This is important to allow us to both use it for a dodging tool, an escape tool, an engage tool. It is critically important that we make Reap as effective as possible. Next is a Soul for a Soul. This is a skill that I would say if you did have more points in Reap with a piece of gear that gives you more points into the Reaper form, I would say that you should dump some more points into this as well as the next skill that we will be talking about. Um, the damage from this is not to be ignored. It is a very important skill, but we can only put one point into it the way that I have my setup right now. So one point into it just so that we can get into the next 
point. Reaper's Curse, just like A Soul for a Soul, is as important. We are going to be critting an enormous amount, and the increased critical strike chance, as well as the increased damage, is extremely important. The health loss on kill is negligible. You will almost never notice it because of how much lifesteal we actually have. Again, if I could put more points into this, I would. I would finish it off, but I simply do not have the skill points required to do so. Next is Death Comes Quickly. We have to put two points into this. It is a good skill, but it is not nearly as important as all the other ones that were just talked about, but two points in it so that we can get to the next thing. And then finally, we have Rapid Destruction. Rapid Destruction increases our cast speed and our attack speed, which are both extremely important if we want to be spamming Reap as often as possible, and we want to be spamming Harvest as often as possible to hit as many crits, as much lifesteal as possible, and as much DPS as possible. It's an extremely important skill point, and I love this skill. Next, we're on to our Bone Curse. Our Bone Curse is extremely important. It helps us to really bump up all of our DPS across the board and allows us to apply the curse, quote unquote, to enemies constantly. Now, if ever there was a skill that I would hate more than wasting three points on is Crippling Anguish. Believe me, the slow is good. It is another debuff that you can put on enemies for certain multipliers, like how many debuffs you actually have on an enemy. But, the slow duration is almost negligible and really doesn't do anything for the build. It's just we need the three points to get to the next point. Now, riding off that absolute disappointment of a skill, we have the Signet of Agony. This is the star of the show here for the Bone Curse. It is extremely important. It is such a good skill for a lazy man like me who just wants to toggle Bone Curse on and have it constantly following me and allow me to constantly shred my opponents from almost any angle and almost any distance. Moving across the board here, we have Iron Maiden, which just gives us more damage multiplicative with other multipliers of 40% whenever we deal damage with Bone Curves. Now, between Iron Maiden and Defiled Defenses, I don't know which one to put more points into. 80% does feel like a good amount because the way that toggling on the aura of Decay, of, of Signet of Agony, and using Defiled Defenses allows you to basically shred armor of enemies per second while standing on top of them. This allows you to increase the DPS of yourself as well as any allies that you may have by just standing next to an opponent. 80% does feel like the good amount, but it kind of depends on your luck. Um, I could say that you could drop this down to 60 and put some more points into Iron Maiden, but that's up to the user. And then we have Conflation, which increases the area of our Bone Curse. This is a ease of use skill. It really does allow us to cover a much larger area around us, which does help when we are also cleaving a massive area with Harvest. And then we have Signal of Mortality, which applies Mark for Death for two seconds on anyone that we touch with Bone Curse. This does work, but it is a little bit less reliable because it only applies the Mark for two seconds, which means that with when an enemy enters your aura, you need to be able to hit them within that two seconds to consume the Mark of Death. The last longer perk does help out a little bit in, in helping this, but it's still not an amazing skill. But that's okay because it's all to get here to Misery. Misery converts our Bone Curse from physical damage into necrotic damage, which is the primarity of all of our scaling of all of our damage is necrotic damage. Even when an enemy resists necrotic damage, we have so much necrotic penetration that it doesn't matter. So, Misery is extremely important because it allows Bone Curse to be a necrotic skill. And next, we'll get into Hungering Souls. This is our spam skill if we do get knocked out of Reaper form. Um, what Hungering Souls does is when you press the button, it sends out a wave of like seven necrotic skulls in a cone in front of you. They home, they home in on enemies and then they hit them and deal damage and they apply a debuff called Possessed, which allows them to take damage over time. Now, I know what you're thinking. If the goal of the build is to never get knocked out of Reaper form, then why do we have a skill for just in case we do get knocked out of Reaper form? Well, it is important to have a skill for when you do get knocked out of Reaper form because there are just certain situations where it's going to happen and there's no way you can prevent it and there's no way of really stopping it. So having a skill for that reason is important. Now, on top of that, we are leveling up the skill because we have many ways to proc this skill passively through other means. And 
through these other means, we will be using a lot of the skills in this skill tree to help us deal even more damage passively without ever having to press the wandering slash hungering souls button. Starting us off strong is the Forbidden Pact. This gives us more spell damage per 20 maximum mana with a slight reduction in projectiles thrown. This is okay because most of our ways of proccing this skill passively only throw a small amount of projectiles anyways. So it's okay that this doesn't have that many projectiles, but the max damage per mana is important because it does increase the damage of the skill significantly. Speaking of jet damage, Ravenous, a very simple skill, just increasing the base damage of the necrotic damage of the Hungering Souls. And three points into it to get us to our next skill. And our next skill is Vengeful Souls, our first form of passively casting our Hungering Souls. This it makes it so that when you are hit by enemies, which you will be a lot because you're in melee range and you're surrounded by enemies relying purely on lifesteal to keep you alive, but when you're hit, you have a chance to throw Wandering Souls. There's a higher chance that it will be just one soul, but that's okay, because there's still a chance that it will be multiple souls. We have ways to increase that chance. Uh, Risen Hatred increases it by 12% chance and makes it so that when you are directly casting it, you have a 12% chance to double cast it. Then Lament gives us an even further increased chance to cast multiple souls when hit and gives us a chance on when we are directly casting it to gain ward on cast. Ward is a type of shield in this game, if you didn't know, it's like over shields. And then we have Reaper's Gaze, which allows souls a chance to instantly kill enemies below a certain threshold. This allows us to just kind of watch enemies die around us as they continuously hit us and then souls are continuously coming out, just pouring out of us at a certain point and just killing people just because. And then we have Dominion of Undeath, which is just another way that we can kind of traverse through the skill tree. It's okay. It, it increases the width of the cone of the souls that you throw out and the mana cost very slightly. And then we have Risen Cemetery. This allows our, all of our Hungering Souls projectiles to have a chance of creating an additional projectile up to six. This is a 40% chance and it can proc on all of our other methods of creating Wandering Souls. And then we have Soul Swarm, which is another four projectiles added to our projectile count, allowing us to throw even more souls. This does increase the mana cost of Wandering Souls, but that's okay because the mana cost isn't important unless you are directly casting it. And then we get into Death Seal. Death Seal is a very important ability, and it is slightly difficult to use. It does take a little bit of getting used to. Basically, upon pressing the death seal button, you will lock your HP at whatever it currently is at that moment. So if you're low on HP and you press death seal, you will lock your HP and not be able to lifesteal it past that amount once it's locked. This does enable a low health build and it is important for a couple of our skill points in the later trees that we'll talk about, but upon pressing the button, you lock your HP. And then, Death Seal does a certain few things depending on what you have skilled. At base, it basically it absorbs all the damage that you deal and then releases it at the end when you reactivate Death Seal. An important note is that when you reactivate Death Seal, it remembers all of the health that you would have gained during the duration, and reactivating it forces you to gain all of that HP in an instant. So first things first, we have this skill. Um, you're going to have to... Excuse me as I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that, but it is a two second increase on the duration This is enabling us to get to the next skill and just based on the picture you guessed it This is devouring release allowing us to repeatedly cast hungering souls while your health is sealed Hungering souls cast this way only have a 70% chance to become a one projectile but again, just like all of our other methods, there are ways to make this increase. In this case scenario, we have Insatiable Soul, which instead of increasing the frequency of the amount of souls that come out per second, per 1.5 seconds, this is increasing the frequency of how many souls are being released every few seconds. A 112% increase on a 1.5 second uh, release Ratio is a pretty big increase. It means that we are releasing souls roughly every 0.3 seconds, I think. 
And now we get into that like low health build, the corrupted consciousness. You need five out of five of this to get to our next skill that's more important than this one. This is 5% increased damage per 3% missing health when you activate and lock your death seal HP. This is a good skill and can be useful in certain situations, but we are not really using this for the reason it's intended. I usually lock my HP at very high. I don't really care about trying to lock it at a low HP. I'm too worried about the risk of death when you are constantly meleeing your opponents. And then we get into the other star of the show, Mortal Pulse. It changes the way the Death Seal works. Instead of pulsing one giant pulse of damage at the end of Death Seal, it now pulses every second while your health is sealed. This is a base, it reduces the base damage of Death Seal's Pulse by 60%, but there are ways to increase this, and that's the next skill we'll talk about. Tachycardia, which increases the frequency of our death waves by 48%, and increases the critical chance by 240%. Um, you could put more points into this, which would make it a 50% and 300% critical chance which would be a good idea if you did have more points into Death Seal or you wanted to take points away from our final skill, Carry On Breath. Carry On Breath is a 90% increase on in the area that the Death Waves will pulse out. Um, it is a very good skill for increasing your general area of effect damage and increasing the ease of use of the skill. And now we'll get into some of the recommended gear for the build. Um, I would say that there are only really three pieces of gear that I think that you really should focus on. The build does work without these three pieces of gear, but it just has slightly lower performance values. Uh, you won't get as high as numbers, you won't get as much damage, you won't get as much survivability. But it does work without it. I have tested it by simply taking off all of my gear and just straight up running into the battle without anything on. I know that the build works without the gear. It's just a skill issue if it doesn't for you. So now let's get into what do I recommend as pieces of gear that you should try and farm for. First things first is your survivability, which is the woven flesh armor. It gives 220 armor, 3% increased health, 3.4% of overkill damage leached as health, 24% Damage leached as health, increased leech rate, and you cannot be critically striked by enemies. This is extremely important for your survivability. Now, where does this drop? Well, you can farm it from the Abomination boss at the first monolith. He is the final boss of the monolith from the first monolith. Um, it's his most common drop. It is very easy to acquire this chess piece, and it is very good for increasing your survivability with this build. And then after your survivability comes your damage, your death's embrace scythe. The scythe is extremely important, and I do fully understand that this is not an easy scythe to come by. Um, I'll fully admit that I bought this using the marketing system in the trading guild. Um, and when I did, I did not regret it. It is such a worthwhile buy. There are people in there that are selling versions of this for zero gold. It does require... A couple thousand reputation it's 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 not that hard of a of a of a convincing you to try and buy this but if you insist on not buying it or you are in the other guild um the way that you do acquire this by normal means is the reign of dragons monolith uh, it drops from any echo that has a unique axe drop rate or a unique axe reward for completing the echo now what does it do it increases your melee necrotic damage by 48%. It upscales all the way up to 50%, I think, or 50 base. Increases your melee critical strike multiplier. Reduces bonus damage taken from critical strikes. That's irrelevant. We don't take critical strikes anyways. But then it gives you a stack of harrowing. Harrowing is basically when you hit, when you hit three times in a row with harvest, your third harvest does 200% more damage with 100% bonus area of effect the only downside to this is it does cost mana and it does cost hp but we don't care about hp i promise you it, just using this will as soon as you hit the strike you will regain all of the health lost from that strike so it is completely irrelevant that it costs health the mana cost is something that we will deal with with our third most important item that i think that you should acquire and that would be 
the Murama's Hilt. The Murama's Hilt gives you a slight amount of attack speed increase. It gives you a massive bonus damage to curse damage and a massive increase to cursed spell cast speed, but we don't need that. It's completely irrelevant because ours is a toggle, but the damage increase is significant. And the four mana gained whenever you use Harvest. Now, the thing about this that's interesting about it is it does not say four mana gain when you use Harvest on hit. It says four mana gain when using Harvest. That means that any time that you use Harvest, whether it's a miss or a hit, you will gain four mana. This scales all the way up to five mana gained, I think, or six, maybe. Um, if you do get a six roll, that's great. If you don't, oh well. Um, this is a completely random world drop. Uh, there is no way to really guarantee you getting this, and there's no real way to farm for it. Uh, it's just best of luck to you. If you can buy it from the Merchant's Guild, I would highly recommend it. But these three items are the critically important things that will make the build really succeed the rest of these items that we're going to go over are simply bonuses that can be used next the amulet the chimera's essence this gives you a pretty nasty increase to your attack speed your melee attack speed and that's great and it also gives you up to 160 percent bonus damage while transformed reperform does count as a transformation so this is great the up to 10% increased movement speed while transformed is great from getting from pack to pack of enemies. And the minus resistances while transformed is negligible. It's, it's completely irrelevant almost. And for the rest of these, especially beyond Chimera's Essence, I will go over them very quickly because they are almost completely irrelevant for the build. Siphon of Anguish is another lifesteal ring. It gives you some void damage on hit. And then we have the Isadora's Tomb Binding for the belt. This is just because it gives us 200 armor and it gives us 80% increase on necrotic damage. If you have recently been hit, we're getting hit all the time, so that's great. Again, not relevant to the build. It's good. It's not needed at all. And then we have a random purple ring that just gives us a good amount of crit critical strike chance. Important for the build just because we like critical strike chance. The mana regen is great because it allows us to further negate the drain from the aura. The aura burn bone curse. And, and then we have uh, a helmet. This helmet is purely for the fact that the innates on it are 30% increased health, or 30 in pre increased mana regeneration, and that's great. We do love intelligence and de dexterity because Reaper form does scale off of both of them. The increase of armor and the increase of health are great stats, but we don't need them. And then we have Xerix Ambition for the boots. These boots give us some melee critical strike chance while we're at full health and some movement speed and some leech rate. The throwing damage doesn't really matter for us. And then some legendary gloves that started out as Weaver's Will gloves that I picked up off the ground. There's literally only one stat on here that really matters to me and that's the 11 percent attack speed the bonus melee damage to high health enemies and the spell damage to low health enemies does help with the build in allowing our melee to shred high health enemies and our hungering souls to damage low health enemies and continue for those executes but again these do not matter and then very quickly we will go over some idols Idols to look out for, these ones I think are the most important, I have two of them in the build. There are 50 to 60% increased damage while transformed, because Reperform is a transformation, this is great. The only other stats that we're really looking out for on idols are stun avoidance, health increasing, and maybe some health on kills and stuff of, of the sort. But these two are the biggest ones, I have two of them in the build, I really like the bonus damage while transformed. And finally, the skill tree. We go for the 8 intelligence on this path. Then we go up for the bonus armor just to get us to the next goal, which would be the 8 vitality from this point. Um, once I get to a higher level, I would love to max out this next skill point, which is the bonus necrotic damage plus bonus damn chance on hit. I would love to get this 6 out of 6, but right now I just don't have the skill points for it. And then we get into the Lich skill tree. On the Lich skill tree, we'll go through this pretty quickly. We got 10 intelligence plus bonus mana regen. It's great for the build. We got bonus spell damage, leech this health, plus a little bit of bonus health. Bonus damage while at low health. This is the great for that low health death seal. The increased necrotic damage is fantastic for the build. 
112 bonus damage with a little bit of health drain. We don't care about that health drain at all. Increased intelligence. I would love to put more points into this. This scales all the way up to 18. This is bonus attack speed and critical strike chance. This is bonus critical strike chance and ward on critical strike. And this is bonus critical multiplier. Great for increasing our damage. Bonus spell damage and melee necrotic damage. Bonus attack speed, movement speed, and leeched health on hit. And even more bonus leech health on hit. And that's everything. I'm so glad for you guys to join me on this build. Um, I've been having a ton of fun with Last Epoch, and I plan to make plenty of other build guides for the other classes that I've been experimenting with. I just fell head, in, head over heels in love with the Lich and was committed to make it work the way I wanted it to work. A true Reaper of Souls playstyle. Um, and I just couldn't find anyone else who wanted to do it, so I made it myself. I really hope that you enjoyed the build. It was really long, and I was trying to give as much detail and as much importance to all of the thing, all of the choices that I made and all of the things that I do to make the build work and really make sure that there was enough detail to give everybody what they needed for the build. But thank you for joining me and I really appreciate it if you guys would like, leave a comment, subscribe, ask me what class maybe you want me to do next. And um, that's about it. This is the Loot Doctor signing off. And remember, Today's prescription is good RNG.